Oh, wow. That does um, better turn that one back on if that's all right. Can everybody still see the screen all right? Okay. Well, still got to see him on camera yet. <coughs> all right. Well, I don't think the microphone's going to work that well tonight, but uh, okay. we'll, we'll just go for next week then. Um, we should still have audio through the... Okay. I'll be fairly right. close to it. Okay. Yeah, okay. Are you ready to roll? I believe so. Why don't you just introduce okay. everybody and then we'll uh, go to the movie. Okay, I want to thank everybody for being here. A great big thank you, though, goes to iHelpU.tech and the study shop for letting us use their facilities. Really do appreciate it. The hospitality is great. Uh, that's one great thing about amateur radio. It's a learning process, and that's a great place to have it in the study shop. Uh, having said that, uh, the very first thing we're going to do uh, is there is a sign-up sheet floating around. Make sure your name's on the sign-up sheet and give me a good email address because that is the way we will talk to you guys, stay in touch with you guys during the class. <laughs> if we never have to call it off because of weather or something, we'll shoot you an email to let you know. So make sure you sign the uh, sign-up sheet. Uh, I would like to help Ben, uh, KD9LJF. Yep. He's our producer. Uh, we got Doug back here, KC9VFI. He's helping with sign up. Uh, Ryan, way in the back. Byron, way in the back. AC9PA. He's also part of the tech crew here. We also have one guy over in Alabama that's uh, monitoring us right now, and he will be answering questions of people that's watching online. We'll be able to give him a question right away. So, this is the very first time we've done this. So, expect mistakes, but uh, we'll get through them. Uh, with that, we want to talk about what is amateur radio. All right, well, we'll get that video going here. Um, again, just this is our first week, so it's going to be a little bit difficult just getting things up and running, but uh, we'll try to smooth the process out as we go, and we'll uh, go from there. So, all right, without further ado. Amateur radio, also known as ham radio, is a popular service and hobby that enables so many activities from public service to scientific experimentation to sheer fun. With more than 740,000 practitioners in the U.S. and 1.75 million worldwide, there are federally licensed amateur radio operators everywhere, in your neighborhood, in your workplace, and in your schools. People just like you use ham radio to communicate without relying on the Internet or a cell phone network, and it can go wherever you go. You can hike a trail, climb a mountain, or paddle a river, and take your radio with you. Ham radio even reaches as far as outer space. Ham radio operators can talk to astronauts aboard the International Space Station, talk to other operators through satellites orbiting Earth, and even bounce their radio signals off the moon and back. The amateur radio service is a valued element of neighborhoods and municipalities across the U.S. In times of disaster, when regular communications channels fail, the amateur radio service works with public service agencies such as FEMA, the American Red Cross, and the Salvation Army to assist emergency communications efforts. Amateurs can also use their radios to volunteer within their communities, providing communications for events like county fairs, parades, and road races. Although people get involved with amateur radio for many reasons, they all pass a test to earn the Federal Communications Commission license that shows they have a basic knowledge of the principles of electricity, radio technology, and operating rules. This knowledge has practical everyday applications that educators have used to teach science, technology, engineering, and math concepts. Lots of hams got into the hobby as kids and followed their interest in radio to exciting careers as astronauts, engineers, pilots, and more. The ham radio frequencies begin just above the AM broadcast band and extend into extremely high microwave frequencies. Ham radio operators use these frequencies to communicate with each other using microphones, Morse code, and even by interfacing a radio with a computer or tablet to send data, text, or images. Some compete in contests, trying to make the most radio contacts within a certain time frame. Amateur radio has been around for over 100 years, and the technology behind it continues to evolve and advance today. Operators are always finding new ways to explore amateur radio, experimenting with digital applications of this technology through things like coding, mobile apps, and drones. To learn more about the endless possibilities of amateur radio, 
where the technology is headed, and how you can get involved, visit ARRL, the National Association for Amateur Radio, at www.arrl.org. It's a, you join it. I think I encourage everybody to join it. It's really a good organization. Uh, before we come up with the actual start to thing tonight, uh, again, I want to thank everybody here, and I want, I want to thank I Help You Tech again. Boy, you guys have just been fantastic here giving us this facility. Uh, tonight's class is about, <coughs> it's the introduction to amateur radio. It's not that long. Are we ready? I believe so. You should be all set. Okay. <coughs> this is the manual we're going to be looking at. We have got a box of manuals around here somewhere. Uh, yeah, we're going to give. We're going to loan these to you free of charge. If you want to buy them, you can. We sell them to you at cost. We got. A, we got them at a big discount. These manuals usually run around uh, anywhere from. We've got two manuals. They've got different bindings. Uh, <coughs> One of them is twenty-five dollars. The other one is twenty-six fifty. One's got the spiral bounding. They're a little bit more. Like I said, we're loaning them to you guys free of charge. We ask that you don't, you know, write in them or tear them up or anything. But if you want to buy them, you can for twenty-five bucks and twenty-six fifty, depending on which one you get. Strongly recommend it, just so you can have it for later on for future. Uh, so after this is all over tonight, we'll go back there and we'll pass out the books for you. There will be a reading assignment. You have to read uh, chapters one and two this next week, that they're very short chapters. It's just uh, good to get together. Anyway, we use the Hammond, Hammond, ARL's Hand Radio License Manual. <coughs> it's a very good book. The first part of it has got all the theory in it. You guys need to know. In the back of the book, there's a little over 400 questions with the correct answer, and it's even got the distracting questions, distractors. Uh, Ten weeks from tonight, when you take your test, you'll be getting... 35 questions, pulled at random from the back of this book. Of those 35 questions, you only have to get 26 correct to get your hand with license. It's like a pass or a fail thing. Uh, the way we work it here at the club is uh, we always have two tests available. In case you fail the first one, we've got another test, different answers of course, but you can try it again for the second time. The test themselves, it's an FCC fee of $15. Uh, that's the only cost in the course. And we wouldn't even do that, but that's a, that's a federal government thing. They really need your tax dollars. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, tonight we're going to be uh, the welcome to amateur radio. And that's all we're going to be doing is just talking about amateur radio in general. We're not going to be talking about any of the theory or stuff like that. Uh, so basically the first thing we want to do, uh, starting right here, just your first name and uh, if you could, why are you taking this course, and what do you know about ham radio? Just very brief, didn't it? Uh, my name is Russell, and I don't Why know where do? I'm Good name. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, I've always been interested in it, it just seemed like it was something fun to do. Oh, okay. And I deal with a lot of electrical stuff right now, oh. because of my job and stuff like that, so. Well, it's you'll... helpful to have like a refresh course of certain electronical theories and other things, and stuff too. Okay, so. thank you Russell. Um, my name is Colby. Just always interested in uh, the radio and radio, uh, and uh, it just seems like a good thing, good way to spend uh, Thursday nights. <laughs> my name is Dustin. Same thing. <clears throat> always been curious about how the whole operation works. You know, <clears throat> I've watched Independence Day. Maybe one of these days I can save the earth. You know. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> we will be talking about Morse code. <laughs> and when, next time you watch, after you take this course, the next time you watch Independence Day. You'll shake your head when you see those key operators the way they send Morse code. <laughs> and it, oh well. <laughs> Jared, I carpool with Dustin. Um, I took a course in ham radio in church camp 30 years ago. Uh, <laughs> fell in love with it and never did any more with it. This is my chance to get educated more. <coughs> it's different now. It's different now. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm Lex. Uh, I've been in electronics for 40 years, and I actually had my hand license thought, oh, 30 years ago or something, and let it lapse, and so I'm seeing about getting it back. 
the nice thing about Lex, when he gets his license 10 weeks from now, he will be able to reapply to the SEC to get his original call sign back. So it's wow. kind of neat. And uh, when you get your license, by the way, if, you know, somebody in your family passed away, your mom, your dad, they had your ham license, you can get their license for you. Oh. So it's kind of neat. Very cool. Amy. I'm Amy. Um, I'm married to Lex. He's talked about, you know, ham radio and radios in general the entire time I've known him. <laughs> and I figured this would be a good, you know, thing to do with him. Something we can do together. Mm -hmm. Keep an eye on him. <laughs> Keep him out of trouble. Kurt. Kurt took his last year through you guys and got my license. And if I can watch the movie a second time, you might pick up on something you missed. You will. My name is Joey. I should have learned about my next uh, My name is Carter. I know nothing about ham radios. I just wanted to learn. Okay. Good. <coughs> Good. I'm Carter's dad, Kelly, <laughs> and I uh, I talked on the radio all my life. Now I kind of like to have a little understanding of what I was doing. Yeah. Uh, these two guys are both uh, volunteer firefighters, and I was telling them a little bit earlier, if the rest of you are, a lot of the radio walkie-talkies are convertible, so that you can actually convert them to the uh, fire frequency and even VHF police frequency, so you can have your handheld on the ham radio frequencies, like if you're weather spotting, and you can also, you know, flip the channel, go to a different memory channel, and talk back to the police station or whatever. Kind of handy. In the back. Uh, my name's Ed. Um, I've just been kind of interested in ham radio and some of the more advanced, uh, kind of the advanced features like TV and texting and uh, sending data over yeah. radio frequency. Oh, that's a big, that's really big anymore, data. I'm also making him take the course as well, so. Yeah. <laughs> still flying the degree up here, I'll tell you. Uh, about expectations. I think we got everybody. I think so. <coughs> expectations. First of all, the class will start on time. We're kind of anal about that. If something's supposed to start at 7 o'clock at night, it's going to start at 7 o'clock at night. We do that for everyone's convenience. Uh, you will know in advance, though, uh, in the books, which what we'll be covering each night. So if you can't make it for one night, you can read along. You can also go we're, online. Yep, we're live streaming it. It'll be on the iHelpy.tech YouTube page, which I think if you look at the National Trail Amateur Radio Club's Facebook group, I believe Jeff linked to that. So uh, this, uh, this stream will be archived to that YouTube page if you need to catch up on something. Yeah. Um, What's your YouTube page again? Uh, iHelpy.tech will be the same for our story. Yep. Really cool. And I don't know if I mentioned Jeff or not. Jeff, N9NJN, he's over at Aldermont monitoring our live streaming. And he's there to answer people's questions that might be in their home. They might have their questions. So that's his job way over in Aldermont. Yep. Uh, we're going to, instructors, there's a couple of us instructors, we will be prepared. Uh, this is a PowerPoint display. This is the first year we've done PowerPoint. Uh, for instance, for tonight, I went over this PowerPoint five or six times, I think. We will be prepared for you. If we don't know the answer to your questions, we will find out the answer. And if we can't find out the answer, we'll make one up and not tell you about it. Put <laughs> it that way. Uh, you are expected to read the assignments. Uh, when you get your books tonight, uh, you'll read chapters one and two. Uh, and that, they're very short chapters. But you just have to read one or two. Uh, in those chapters, they will reference you to questions in the back of the book. Don't bother about that. Just read the stuff that's in there. Don't worry about the question. That's what this class is going to be doing, going over the questions for you. It's not a spectator sport. The only dumb question is the one that's not asked. If I'm up here, or if, say, Doug's up here teaching, uh, if, if we use some sort of a slang or anything like that you don't understand or a term you don't understand, raise your hand and stop us immediately. Because that's our job, is to get you familiar with all this stuff. And a lot of times with 
Doug and I, we've been doing this for quite some time now. We use slang without even realizing that not everybody in the world knows what we're talking about. Basically, this course overview, there are nine different chapters. Tonight, we're going over this Welcome to Amateur Radio. Uh, next Thursday night, we're going to be going over radio signals and fundamentals. Uh, the third night, the th uh, third Thursday night, is going to be your longest night. Uh, it's about electricity, components, and circuitry. Uh, the fourth night, we're going to be talking about my favorite, propagation antennas and feed lines. This is the nitty-gritty of amateur radio. Uh, we're going up to the fifth night will be amateur radio equipment. We're going to be talking about amateur radio equipment. So you'll have some sort of an idea about what to look for in equipment. That's why we definitely want you to take some of those QST magazines so you can just page through them. They're older magazines, but you know the equipment's all basically the same. But we want you to take these QST magazines. Uh, QST, by the way, is the house magazine for ARRL. So uh, we want you to take some of those so you'll get an idea about amateur equipment. But like I said, that night we'll be going over all the amateur radio equipment. The next one is the communication with other hands. This is uh, how you actually talk to people. And it's not just with microphones. You might, some of you might get into Morse code, CW. It's not required anymore, but a lot of people do get into it. They find it's nice. Uh, CW, by the way, is the very first digital communications. Amateur radio, yay, we did it. But all this, all the digital communications you see going on today, the basics, the foundation was Morse code, CW. Uh, licensing regulation, we're gonna be talking about what you gotta do to get your license basically take these tests and pass them and everything. Uh, operating regulations, we'll be telling you that, uh, you know, if you're a CB'er, you're allowed 12 watts peak to peak on sideband. Amateur radio, you're allowed 1,500 watts. You're given a whole bunch more power. Among other things too, uh, license or frequency privileges, that kind of stuff. And then last, last and certainly not least, is safety. We'll be going over safety, not just electrical safety, telling you not to, you know, stick a hairpin in these outlets, but RF safety too. That we want you to keep away from, you know, the ends of the antennas where you can get an RF burn. And if you've never had an RF burn, it's a real neat experience. Um, a regular burn burns the surface of your finger. An RF burn goes straight into the bone, and it stays there for a long time. So safety is a, a very big thing, and that's why they have one whole week just on safety by itself. So let's get started. Our goal tonight is to get each and every one of you your technician class license. You'll be taking the test on April 9th uh, in here. We'll gather up all the test questions. We're going to send them in to ARRL. They will uh, do the paperwork there. Then they send it to the FCC in Gettysburg, PA. And they are the ones that will assign you your call signs. Uh, you'll be getting a call sign KD9 and then three letters behind that. So that'll give you an idea. Lex, for instance, he's going to get rid of his that they issue him and he's going to go back to his WD9 whatever it was. Still remember it? DWD9 DPE is what it was. Okay. Uh, one thing, too, I want to stress this word here, transmitter. Anybody can turn on a ham radio and listen. But when you key the mic, when you start to transmit, that's when you have to have your license. And that's what this class is all about, getting your license so you can transmit on the air. So, what is ham radio? Uh, it's an amateur radio, it's a personal radio service as opposed to public safety radio service, commercial radio service, commercial TVs. It's for personal people, uh, for personnel. We like to say there's about four points uh, to amateur radio. We like to encourage the art and science of radio. We want you guys to experiment with stuff. Emails. Amateur radio was the developing source for the emails that go out around. They, have, they did it by radio waves going through repeaters. Now, of course, you do it through the internet. But it was amateur radio that basically is the father, mother and father of uh, emails and stuff like that. We want to uh, promote the development and emergency communications to assist communities. Years back, amateur radio operators was very important 
because we could back up police communication, fire communication. If something happened, we could go in and stand next to a cop, and we could radio back and forth so he could get his information from headquarters. Being quite honest, thank you. Being quite honest about it nowadays, the equipment that the fire department's got, the police department's got, is very good, reliable equipment. So we aren't really concerned about helping out the police and fire department with what with their communication needs in an emergency. What we are more pointed toward uh, is communications for groups, like the American Red Cross. If an ice storm would happen to hit Effingham County, the Red Cross might want to set up Red Cross shelters in T-Town, Aldermont, Edgewood. Red Cross might come to Amateur Radio and say, we would like radio communications between our four shelters or our five shelters or whatever. That's where we come in at. The uh, March of Dimes may be having a big parade. They want people along the route to relay information. You know, if there's someone who gets sick or if there's been an accident or something, that's where Amateur Radio steps in. We can do that for them. And we're very happy and proud to do it. We want to do it. Another thing is this last bullet point, to promote international goodwill. I'm going to promise you guys this. When you get on the air, you will be talking around the world. You'll be talking around the county, Effingham County, on our two-meter VHF repeaters. But you also have frequency privileges where you can, and I mean this literally, you can talk around the world on it. It's amazing. You can also talk uh, out into space to the space shuttle. We'll touch on that a little bit later on in the course. So, uh, through ham radio, they say you'll become an ambassador for your community and your country. We explain that sentence by this. You can talk about anything, but don't talk about politics and religion. <laughs> <laughs> it's just it's not going to go anywhere. Right? But uh, you will be an ambassador. And you have to understand, too, even if you're talking to someone in Bogota, Colombia, there may be a guy in Ireland that can hear your conversation perfectly well. So you've got to watch what you're saying on the air. You know, you don't want to, you don't want to start World War III. That would really be bad for us. We are covered by FCC Rules Part 97. This booklet here tells us our do's and our don'ts, what we can do, what we can't do. Uh, CBs, for instance, have a Part 95 on theirs. But we're Part 97. Anyone could be a ham radio operator. Anyone. Here's, uh, here in Effingham County, we had a young lady, her name was Elizabeth from Mason, and I think she was eight or nine years old when she got her license. Her dad was a ham. So, uh, anyway, she was eight or nine. And anyone can be a ham radio operator. You don't have to be an American citizen. It says anyone, there's a little caveat to that, a foreign diplomat cannot have an American ham radio license. But his secretary, his assistant, they can, but the diplomat himself or herself cannot have a license. I don't know why, that's just the way it is. But anyone can have a ham radio license if you're in the United States and take the test and pass it. This thing here, amateur radio operators cannot accept payments of any kind for using your radio. And to explain it even further, if you're at a Red Cross shelter and you've got your little generator going and you're giving the Red Cross sh uh, shelter communications with the other shelters around, Red Cross cannot come back and give you money for gas. You can accept no money for your actions on amateur radio operators. A TV uh, company might want you to go in and, with your handy talkie and get information on whatever's going on. You know, they can't give you money for going in there. They can't pay for your uh, hamburgers and Cokes or anything. You can accept no money for your business on amateur radio. So what all do we do? We communicate. We talk to people. Not just with microphones. A lot of people, when they think of ham radio operators, they're thinking of a guy, you know, talking on a mic, talking to a person in Russia. Not so anymore. That happens all the time, of course. But there's also the digital communications, uh, slow scan TV, which is just sending a picture over the air. There's fast scan TV. Uh, we haven't approached the uh, Effingham High School, but the Effingham High School has got their own ham radio call sign. I've always thought, wouldn't it be a great idea if the ham club at the Effingham High School would start televising their sports events? They can do it legally. 
They can't sell advertising, because that would be accepting money, but they can actually televise the sports if we could get their club really active and going. I hope we can someday. Experimenting. Like I said, amateur radio is the parents of emails and all this stuff. We, we want you guys to experiment. You can buy all sorts of uh, kits on the air where you can try digital communications, linking stuff around, uh, but we want you to experiment. Building. Uh, Byron back there is building an amplifier, and I'm telling you, I saw it, it's a work of art. Maybe we can get you to bring that in here sometime. His amplifier he's building is just beautiful. We want people to build too, because that's how you find out things, uh, how, how they work. Competing, that's my favorite. Sports, radio sports. The, third, the fourth Friday of every June, they have an event called Field Day. It is where ham radio clubs throughout the United States and Canada get together and they see how many other clubs they can contact. It's a really great social event. It's a great operating event. You get to come in and see all the guys bringing in different radios and stuff. Most of the people that come to the field day uh, really don't even operate. There's just a few of us diehards that are really the operators. But you come to these things not only to meet ham radio operators from your vicinity, your community, but you ought to get to see, you get to see all the fantastic equipment that's out there. And it's, it's just really a lot of fun on competing. We serve their communities, like I said. We might provide communications for walkathons, for shelters, houses. And we always engage in a lifelong learning. Every time you get a magazine, every time you come to a club meeting, I guarantee you, you'll learn just a little bit more about radio communications. And that's what really we're all about here. So what makes us different from other services? We've got FRS, the Family Radio Service. Family Radio Service is those little bitty walkie-talkies that you can buy at the big box stores. $20 for two of them. They only put out a half a watt. They're FM. They're great for camping. They've got a really short range. Or if you're out fishing, someone in a boat, someone on the shore can have it. They're really great for that. They're not, you don't have to have a license. You just have to buy one. Uh, the, like I said, FRS is only a half a watt, so it's, it's really low power. It's also up in the UHF spectrum, and it's FM. So when you do have communications, it's good communications, good quality communications. CBs. I think we're all familiar with CBs, uh, limited to 4 watts on AM, 12 watts peak to peak on sideband, only 40 channels you get to operate on. GMRS, General Mobile Radio Service. The General Mobile Radio Service is right in the same, literally right in the same group as FRS. In fact, sometimes you can buy these little walkie-talkies, handy-talkies, with both the FRS frequencies and the GMRS frequencies. And some frequencies even change. The neat thing about GMRS is its output is at 2 watts now. Plus, with GMRS, you can have a repeater. And a repeater is that remote site up on top of a hospital or something where your little walkie-talkie can get into that repeater and then it rebroadcasts out a lot stronger. So with this little two-watt walkie-talkie, you can maybe talk maybe a 20-mile radius with that little sucker. So GMRS is really nice. <coughs> Excuse me. Amateur radio is very flexible. Like I said, these three up here mentioned, you know, they're stuck on frequencies. FRS has got about seven channels, that kind of thing. Uh, amateur radio is very f flexible because we don't have channels. We've got groups of frequencies. We've got fewer restrictions. We don't. We aren't stuck with just AM or sideband. Uh, we can do CW, voice, sideband, scanner, uh, television, everything. We have very few actual restrictions because we have all these frequencies and channels. We have. We get so many frequencies that we get to use absolutely free of charge. And you've got to think that in federal courts throughout this nation, there's some lawyer making about 400 bucks an hour trying to get the FCC to give him one frequency for his, his claim. And we have literally got millions of channels we can use, millions of frequencies. We've got the more power, of course. Like I said earlier, we can go up to 1,500 watts. That's a lot of power. That's more than you know some AM radio stations. More ways to communicate through repeaters, uh, through the internet. There's one uh, program on the internet when you, you 
want to think about downloading as soon as you get your license, you want to download Echolink. Echolink is when it's hooked up to the internet. You download Echolink and you, you go up and down its menu and you can find Israel. So you click on Israel and it shows all the repeaters in Israel that's hooked up to Echolink. So you can click on that repeater in Jerusalem. And with your mic on the computer, or if you have your walkie-talkie linked to your computer, hooked to your computer, you can talk to Israel on a little bitty walkie-talkie. It's amazing. Echolink is a, is a very good program. And of course, it is free to operate your radios. Now, with all these privileges, <coughs> someone's going to say no to you. It's a government thing. There is a lot of responsibilities. Uh, and because we have all these capabilities of going on all these different frequencies and lots of powers, we want to make sure that we do not interfere with other radio services. Because we can't. So that's a big no-no. Uh, we have this unlimited reach. You can reach around the uh, globe and into space. Yes, there is a ham radio station on ISS, the International Space Station. And you can talk to it if they're on the air coming over. <clears throat> with the International Space Station, though, when it's going over, you've only got about a four or five minute window because it goes zooming across. Uh, how many of you have seen the ISS go over? Oh, isn't it something, a, it looks like a really bright star zipping right along, but you can't talk to it. <coughs> this is why you are here. So you can get that FCC authorization. So you can get the privileges of talking on all these frequencies and doing all this stuff. Now, the steps to getting your license, the study manuals. This manual we're going to be passing out. Uh, we have the current edition, by the way, but you'll want to study that manual. Read the chapters and then go to the back and start reading those questions. Because those questions, like I said, they're going to take 35 out of those 400 and some questions, and that's going to be your test. That question pool in the back of the book. The question pool changes about every three, four years. So, uh, but we're current right now. We've got you the current questions. So you want to spend time in the back of that book reading through the questions, memorizing them. You can also get online and take a practice exam. Uh, ARRL.org forward slash exam review. Or you can go to qrz.com, qrz.com. Uh, qrz.com is like a private website, I think, or I can describe it like that. Uh, uh, then ARL is, of course, the national one. I'll give you a second or two to write those down. It's very important, if you go take those practice tests, by the way, uh, it will let you uh, know how you stand. And if you go home tonight and take those practice tests, I think you might be really surprised about how many of you are going to get right without even going through this class. <coughs> the uh, practice a proctored 35 question multiple choice test. Proctored means that when you take your test, there's going to be at least three of us VEs, volunteer examiners, will be looking at doing the test. We don't look over your shoulder. We don't try not to be intrusive. But we, it takes three of us exam, examiners you take your test, we grade your thing right there that night, and we'll tell you that night whether you passed or failed. <clears throat> in the years that we've been doing this, I know of only one person that's failed to get a license. And we have run a lot of people through this course. So you got to understand, we've got all those questions in the back of the book. You know, read them. And we, and we usually recommend that you read the question and then read the correct answer. You will have the three distractors. Just get it in your mind of reading the question and then the correct answer. That way, if you happen to get one of those questions that you've been having trouble with on the test, use your instinct and you'll probably grab the question you've been reading all the time. So you want to do that. These questions are pulled directly from the uh, question pool, uh, and they are exactly as written at, in the question pool. Uh, even the abbreviations and periods and question marks are all the same. Those questions are exactly from the question pool as written. And, like I said, you only need to get 26 of them right out of those 35. The way this PowerPoint is set up, uh, we go through the first part of it where we talk about whatever the subject is for the evening. When we get talking, done about talking about the subject, then we go into the practice questions. 
This is a practice question. Uh, what agency regulates and forces the rules for amateur radio service? Everyone knows it. It's the FCC, right? Uh, this letter down here, when we're going through the questions next week, this is the only question we're going to do this week. This is kind of like an example. Uh, you'll be going to the back of your book, and you'll find that T1, which is the very first set of questions, and then AO2. And when you find a, a T1, AO2, it will be this exact question. And in the back of the book, it will have the four answers, possible answers. And over to the side of the page, it will tell you which is the correct answer. And it also tells you where to go back into the book to uh, reinforce what you've learned. At the FCC. When you're around ham radio operators, you might hear somebody talk about Uncle Charlie. Uncle, uh, back in, I th think it was the 60s, maybe early 70s, the head of the FCC, his name was Charles something or other, Charlie. Uh, he was a real, he was really proactive for amateur radio. But he also expected ham radios to toe the line. You know, no, no obscenities, uh, stay on frequency, stay on power and all this stuff. And if you did something wrong, you got a letter from Uncle Charlie. And when you, even today, if you would get a letter from the FCC when you're telling your friend, oh, I got a letter from Uncle Charlie. Don't sweat it too much. Basically, all you have to do is write back to whoever sent you the letter from whatever home office of the FCC and just explain what happened and then it's all forgotten. Really cool. The only time the FCC will ever bug you is that if you start interfering in other frequencies. Yes, we've had ham radio operators to get on police frequencies and put out false calls and other crappy <coughs> stuff like that. Well, we don't do that. Amateur radio is very proud of the fact that our, our language and what we do on the air is cleaner than what you will find on CBS, NBC, Fox News, or anything. We really, we don't use any curse words. That was politics and religion at one thing. One <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, we're ready for the next movie. All right, well, we'll get that swapped over. To anyone listening on the stream, we might have a bit of an interruption here, but we'll uh, uh, get that up and rolling. Are there any questions, questions at this point? Yes. Yeah. A whole section on repeaters, but re re repeaters is really nice. The Effingham uh, National Trail Amateur Radio Club, we have two repeaters here in Effingham. One is the two meter repeater up on top of the hospital, and the other is a UHF repeater on top of Effingham Equity. My goodness, we got uh, flora, we can talk all around on them. We can pull up repeater book yeah, on there too if you want it. These parts have to be repeaters also. Does that impact them? You just not on the, Don't on quite the understand board. the question. The police and fire, oh. EMS, their repeaters, can we bounce off those? Yeah. No, no. Okay. That's asked. Thank no. You. But our repeaters work just like theirs, but we stay off their frequencies. Yeah. We do stay off their frequencies. We ready? I believe so. Okay. So, um, From England. Oh, speaking of which, that's probably our UHF repeater that's going over the scanner right now. Yep, but yeah, we'll uh, go ahead and get start that. We live in an age of amazing technology. But for some people, just being a consumer of off-the-shelf gadgets isn't enough. If you're bored with this and looking for something more exciting, why not take a trip around the world at the speed of light? Delta Kilo 8 Lima Golf. This is Mike X-Ray Zero Sierra Sierra Whiskey. Okay, thank you, Frank, for coming back to my QRZ call. My name is Adam, as in Alpha Delta Alpha Mike. Alpha Delta Alpha Mike. Adam, Adam is my name. I we all love to communicate. Amateur radio takes you beyond being a mere gadget user. It challenges you by putting you in charge of the technology. The bit that always interested me in the amateur radio was always the construction. One of the big things I've been interested in constructing is uh, using the Raspberry Pi in amateur radio because it's a small single board computer. It has a lot of potential, a lot of opportunities. 
So we're building a radio uh, receiver. Okay. And so I'm just on the part which is the demodulator. This is a hobby with hundreds of different ways to have techie fun. Using this simple ham radio transceiver and a good antenna, you can talk to other amateurs around the world and you can do it from almost anywhere. I'm at a portable station. The radio signals you transmit travel around the world at the speed of light. No internet connection or mobile phone signals are needed. Just your own skills as a radio ham. I'm 11 years old and I'm about to do the foundation license here in England, over. I got into amateur radio really to get a greater understanding of technology. I spend so much time on my phone, on laptops, and really have no idea how any of it works. It was a really, really welcoming experience for me, um, a really great community, and really, really easy to actually do. In disaster situations, when normal communications are out of action, amateur radio still gets the message through which is why many hams belong to organisations that train their members to provide emergency radio links when needed. I like the practicality of being able to send a message and know how to get something out to someone under your own steam, so kind of making it yourself. And I'm very interested in being able to do the electronics, being able to build things, being able to be self-reliant. Um, in communication, I think that's really interesting. It's great fun talking to other hands in unusual and sometimes exotic places around the world. And beyond. The International Space Station carries ham radio gear on board and there's always licensed amateurs among the crew to use it, such as Commander Doug Wheelock. Uh, I've really enjoyed using the ham radio and uh, talking to ham radio operators all over the world. Radio amateurs around the world also build and launch their own satellites, and hams anywhere can use them for space communication experiments, and of course, to chat to each other. Golf 1 X-ray India Echo. Uh, Golf 1 X-ray India Echo, uh, Golf Bravo 1 Yankee Oscar Tango America afternoon, uh, 5 and 9. We're using SO50, which is an FM uh, transponder uh, satellite which was going over from uh, about west to north, around uh, 70 degrees elevation. When computers and radios come together, there's a whole bunch of new opportunities for hands to connect by radio, sending text, transmitting pictures or real-time video, even displaying data from an amateur radio satellite orbiting the Earth. Mike 6, November, Yankee Kilo. CQ, 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 GB1, Yota. I got started in amateur radio because I'm a girl guide leader and I wanted to take up a hobby that I could do with my brownies. The interesting aspect of amateur radio is that you do learn how it works and um, you get to communicate with loads of different people, find out about different areas of the world. You learn a bit more about the science of how it works and you have a much more profound understanding of something, a technology that is going on all around you. In amateur radio, sport and radio fit together well too. I'll take another bearing in a minute because I don't trust that. These guys are trying to locate hidden radio transmitters, racing against each other and the clock. Amateur radio is a fantastic hobby for anybody who loves technology. I've only really been involved in the hobby for a really short amount of time and I've been speaking to people all across the world. It's a really, really inviting community. One minute you're speaking to somebody about amateur radio and it leads on to so many other discussions about other different technologies you may not have even thought of. So if you do get a chance, come and join us. Those satellites, amateur satellites, we've got the geostationary satellites that are like staying up in one spot where you can just use them constantly. We've also got the low earth orbiting satellites. They're the ones that come zipping over like the space station does. you got to have a little computer program to locate them. Heavensabove.com is a good, that's what I use at home. Shows you where all the satellites are at. So you can plan ahead when the satellite's coming over. And that's really cool because with the satellite, 
you can talk to anybody on your hemisphere. You know, if they're in that footprint of the satellite. So it's really cool. Uh, other than that, this is the shortest night. Most nights will be about an hour and a half long. There is one, the third week may be longer. It's quite a bit. It's about circuitry and components and stuff like that. So, uh, before we leave, I want to again thank uh, I Help You Tech for the room and everything. And for the pizzas, uh, if you haven't had a pizza, go grab one, by golly. Uh, I don't need any. <laughs> but, anyway. <laughs> Uh, we do. Uh, we're glad to see so many people here. Make sure you're on the sign-up sheet. And as you're leaving, uh, you can go and pick up the uh, license manual. And we'll just get your name and address. Like I said, that license manual, mm -hmm. we loan it to you free of charge. You don't have to pay for it. But you are expected to turn it back in. If, when you take the test, we can give it to the next class. But if you want to buy the uh, manual, and I really <coughs> try to impress upon you to buy one, uh, that's why you can have it for reference for the rest of your life. So, so does anyone have any questions before we kind of disperse? Yeah. On your lesson, can you upgrade it? Get uh, license and also. Yeah, there are three grades of license. You guys are going after the technician class. The next one up is the general class. This general class uh, is also a 35 question test. You've got to get 26 of them right. And it just builds on what you'll be learning here for the next nine weeks. Uh, once you get your general class, then you go up to the extra class. The extra class has got a 50 question test. And it gets a lot deeper into it. Uh, you get more frequency privileges each time you upgrade. Uh, I'm an extra class. That means I can go anywhere on the amateur band and talk. If you're a technician class like you guys, you basically have UHF and VHF privileges. You do have one privilege, some privileges on an HF band. You can on 10 meters where you can talk on. Is that so? The map here with different color codes. Is that related to? Like? Yeah, that's the map you guys got there. Uh, like I said, you call sign belongs all have a nine in it. <laughs> yeah, and on the other side, it'll show your frequency privileges. What you get to, the frequencies you get to talk on. On the on the on the that you're going to get. Yeah. Do you still have to pass a code test? For no, there is no more Morse code. No more Morse code. Used to, you had to do at least five words a minute uh, to get in. They did away with Morse code. So, you don't have to worry about code at all. What does WC stand for except Morse code? Pardon me? We'll be taking it. You're talking about Morse code, you're referring it to as a continuous wave. Continuous wave or Morse code. All right, well, I guess does anyone else have any questions then? Oh, yeah. Well, hey, thank you so much for coming out. I think at this point, if you're listening on the stream, we'll go ahead and end it here. But uh, again, thank you and hope to see everybody next week.